I am so excited um, to be a part of this panel, um, mostly because these human beings are amazing and our conversations so far have been so inspiring and enlightening. But also, my name is Cynthia Langtu. Uh, I am a board member with Point Source Youth. I'm also a licensed clinical psychologist. And the bulk of my life's work has been around um, working with people who've experienced trauma. And uh, to say that this conversation is integral uh, in the way that we're thinking is so important. So I'll let our uh, panelists introduce themselves briefly, and then we're going to dig into what I know will continue to be an exciting and riveting conversation. So. Hi, I'm Annie Seaton, um, and I'm here from Bard College, where I founded and uh, direct the Difference in Media Project, um, and also teach humanities and experimental humanities. So excited to be here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Raquel Willis, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm executive editor at Out Magazine, and I also am the founder and director of a project at Transgender Law Center called Black Trans Circles. And it's all about helping uh, black trans women find safety, support, and solace in areas that have had high rates of violence. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I'm honored. No, hi, I'm Dazon Dixon. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Dazon Dixon Jalo. I'm founder and president of Sister Love in Atlanta and in Johannesburg. And I'm also a co founder of the reproductive justice movement, including Sister Song, um, Women of Color, National Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. And I'm really honored to be here. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Did I say I live in Atlanta, so that's going to be the context. Woo. It's going to be a Southern talk this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, our topic today is inherited trauma. Considering the present in light of historical oppression, uh, and there's so much, of course, that could be under that umbrella. But I'll start off by asking uh, our panelists, and we were asking, so what does inherited trauma mean? I think we have this vague notion of what that means, but there's so much under that umbrella. So uh, let, let's look under that umbrella. How would our panelists define inherited trauma? So I'm going to take, because I'm still working on what I think this big overall term yeah. means, mm -hmm. but I'm going to come at it with two very quick things. One is, and, and I, for the large part, I mostly, um, in addition to doing the work we do around sexual and reproductive health rights and justice, I do it with an HIV lens, right? And so I'm in this constant struggle to make sure that whether it's the activism or the advocacy or whether it's the... Uh, policy work, whatever it is that we're doing, the science itself, all of this information and all of this effort to get to the quote end of the epidemic, my argument is consistently, so what are you doing to make sure we all get to the end at the same time, right? And today is June 19th. So does anybody know what holiday today should and will be in the future? Juneteenth. Juneteenth. And for those who don't know, it's a simple, and there's a longer story, go, thank you. Y'all can celebrate, happy Juneteenth. <laughs> and for those who don't know, and you do, a, do, a re, do your own study or read about what it actually meant and the course that it took to get to a Juneteenth, but the bottom line is on June 19th in 1865, was the year that about a quarter of a million people who were still enslaved three years after Emancipation Proclamation had not yet gotten their freedom. And so today actually marks the true liberation from that point of slavery in this country uh, because there are other points we can talk about. And it's the same thing. So that inherited trauma for me is we're continually in this struggle and this cycle of making sure that whether it's about black bodies, brown bodies, queer bodies, uh, uniquely female bodies, that we are equally, equitably, and justly getting to the goals of righteous or of liberation at the same time. It also means we have to understand why black folks have high blood pressure. <laughs> okay? And it's not because all of our food is full of salt and grease. But it is, and it's tasty. But it's always been that way. It's always been that way. What hasn't always been that way since the mid-1800s is that we haven't all been working outside 12, 14 hours in burning, blistering sun with no access to water so that our bodies over three and 400 years 
had to figure, figure out by adaptation to absorb and hold the water. So we still hold that water, but we're holding that water inside, in the cool, watching television and playing on computers. And so that pressure is now killing us when before it was saving our lives. That's what inherited trauma looks like. And that's what has to start from the practical, from the physical, and then there's the mental, emotional, and spiritual. Wow. <laughs> so the situatedness in our spirits and our bodies of what we hold over time, right? And specifically for black bodies. Um, but when we think about what that means for each and every one of us and what we bring to the table. Um, and also I heard you say, you know, the moving together, the equitability and making sure that everyone is moving together as part of that umbrella of inherited trauma. Thank you, Dizan. I, I just would like to add to the conversation because I, I think, you know, one of the things that's frustrating for, for me, and we were kind of talking about this earlier, is that oftentimes when we have conversations about inherited trauma, it, it's so, so much of the conversation is focused on race, right, or ethnicity, which obviously as a black trans woman, like that all matters to me. And there's particularly some pieces that are focused around gender, right? And focused around the ways in which we may move as queer folks. And so I know that my experience as a black trans woman in 2019 is not entirely disconnected from the experiences that were happening generations ago, right? And, and the ways in which we are policed in our families um, and have been policed for generations to act the way a boy is supposed to act or act the way a girl is supposed to act. And sometimes there has been violence because of that, right? There have been ways in which we have been harmed by the people that we love um, because we're supposed to fit a particular mold and we don't. And so I, I think about that and, I, and I, just like you, I'm still working through what that means because I also know that for a lot of people, a lot of the stock around this conversation is based in the biological elements, right? Or in, in the biologically inherited elements. But I think about the fights of people like a Marsha P. Johnson, right? And how I feel so wedded to a similar fight against the violence that has happened from the state or the violence that has happened from various communities that I'm supposed to be a part of, right? Um, and in and, and learning that, what does that mean? Because when I was reading about Stonewall in high school, I was sobbing, right? And I felt that in my core. When I learned and, and heard more stories about other LGBTQ folks living through the HIV AIDS crisis of the 80s, I felt that on a deep level as someone who in many ways lost, you know, many of us lost a generation of people who could have been mentors, right? Who could have been family to us that we will never have that kind of in-person, in-the-flesh connection to, but there's still a sense of mourning, there's still a sense of, of feeling um, the harm of losing them. Mm. And so I think that um, there's some nuance there, right, that we're going to probably hash out as we continue to talk, but all of that, right, all of the, the trauma about my race, the trauma about my gender, the, about my queerness is all wrapped up in each other. Mm. Thank you. And as we were talking earlier, um, one of the things that really struck me, um, you know, from a psychologist's perspective, I often think about intergenerational trauma uh, as, you know, passed down from generation to generation and epigenetics, the stuff that we hold in ourselves, right? From our parents and grandparents and great grandparents and the ancestors um, and how we live that out um, from a trauma perspective, but also from a resilience perspective. But in talking to you and thinking about the intergeneration or multi-generational trauma that happens systemically, how many folks are removed from their families of origin or don't have that connection and have created families, created communities, and then there's intergenerational trauma there. You're reading Stonewall and, and you feel that in your core, right? You feel that loss of that generation of those mentors. So it's not just the epigenetic or intergenerational trauma that happens in your family of origin, but also in this 
created family in your soul. And so there are multiple levels and layers. I thought that was so important. So thank you for illuminating that piece. And we'll come back to the intersectionality conversation mm -hmm. and uh, what to do with all of that, what yeah. it even means. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to get a little geeky, but I think Yay, because um, <laughs> my life has been spent in um, academic institutions, elite academic institutions, much like this one, um, often with a sense of feeling a kind of trauma that was either unstated, denied, or actually erased. This is a quick anecdote about when I was in grad school at Harvard at one point, I kept noticing books about um, the history of eugenics and scientific racism that literally said record missing. And I went and I talked to some of the librarians and I said, why is this? And they said, oh, you know, sometimes we just get rid of stuff we think is too offensive. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so this is, is this Nazi Germany? Is this? Um, yeah, this is America. Um, so one of the people um, who we think about as a founding father, Thomas Jefferson, um, was was convinced that, that black people were genetically inferior, um, and his analysis um, was based on the work of Edward Long, who'd used um, what he thought of as scientific research to decide that black people actually were part of a separate species from white people. Um, and so Je Thomas Jefferson actually wrote that um, black men preferred um, orangutans and that orangutans preferred black women, um, that male orangutans, quote, conceive a passion for the Negro women, such as inclines one animal towards another of the same species. Um, and I read this quote partly to think about, if we, if we start to think about black bodies within normative categories, has there ever been a time when we could say that the black body was ever cis, was ever normative? was ever anything other than seen as a kind of um, a distortion or a kind of uh, perversion. And sort of that, for me, is a form of, of historical trauma. And then th thinking, I, I want to also root my comments very specifically in this place. So um, here in New York, which was a, his a historical center, not just of the slave trade, but also of scientific racism, um, the origins of the medical school at Columbia University, which was then called King's College, um, had an ample source of cadavers at its southeast corner, the Negro's burial ground. So the faculty and students of King's College harvested colored corpses from the African cemetery um, for years. That was the sort of, that was the basis of um, fundamental scientific research um, that, that was done. Um, here, right in New York. And I think another, an interesting thing about trauma is that often we get the sense that, um, I mean, I know from my own educational experience that um, it's as if we black people ourselves had never really done anything um, kind of historically uh, to try to combat the, the violence of slavery and the violence of um, segregation. And one of the things that's really fascinating um, to me is that in the 1830s, every single one of the Ivy League schools was run by people who were in favor of colonization, which meant sending black people back to Africa. Um, at the same time, those same colonization activists targeted, among other um, institutions, Prudence Crandall, who was a woman who was running a school for African-American girls um, in Connecticut, they actually physically destroyed the school and had her criminally prosecuted. Mm -hmm. um, in 1835, there was a, a place called Noise Academy in New Hampshire that was open to um, men, boys and girls of all races, um, and, and that school was violently destroyed. A mob of 300 people hunted black students with guns and a cannon, then used oxen and horses to pull the academy's building from its foundations and drag it through town. Um, and, you know, sort of thinking, oh, well, that was the 1830s. You know, things are, um, things are different now. Um, when I was in fourth grade, and this was not in the 1830s, even though I'm not a millennial, um, <laughs> my teacher looked at me and he said, you know, Annie, um, you're artificial, you're a product of technology because the races were not supposed to meet. Um, 
around that same time, I was also taken into a room by a bunch of teachers um, who quizzed me over and over, insisting that I was cheating because I couldn't possibly know the answers to this test that no one else had to take. It was like a eugenics experiment that was done on me. Um, and I just, I share these experiences because at the time they happened to me, I didn't know. When my teacher told me that I was artificial and a product of technology, I didn't realize that he was parroting Hegel, Jefferson, Louis Agassiz, um, and you know, um, a whole history of scientific racism that continues to traumatize and dehumanize um, black kids in, in and out of medical, academic, and scientific institutions. So, um, so often I feel like trauma is presented as if it's something that we carry through our bodies partly because of, um, you know, initially um, well into the 1980s, there was this attempt to argue that there was a kind of pathological character that slaves had developed um, from our experience of having been enslaved, so that somehow it was our fault we'd internalized this. And I think that still continues, especially in academic institutions. Com most conversations around diversity and inclusion, for instance, are so problematic because they sort of center the notion that we have to, you know, it, like there's this elaborate dinner party and if we just behave well enough, we'll be included. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I don't want to be invited. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks. Um. Thank you. Um, and, and the attack on, hi historical attack on black bodies, I was thinking about Ta-Nehisi Coates's, and I'll get this quote wrong, um, but he says something to the effect of um, that, you know, the attack on black bodies is not an anomaly. Um, in fact, it's tradition. It's the tradition upon which our country was built. Right, it's intentional. You know, and again, while I was in grad school, the book The Bell Curve came out, huh. and, which is the book that argued for the permanent genetic, you know, so we were saying in the, in the room there, we yeah. were saying from, you know, eugenics to epigenetics, but back and forth, it doesn't stop because this book was the work of a senior faculty professor at Harvard. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, you know, this guy's terrible. Well, what I wonder is what about all those colleagues Who sat that watched? helped him to get tenure and promotion? Mm -hmm. And what about all the colleagues at places like NYU and Columbia who sat with him at conferences and mm -hmm. listened to his work? Yeah. And how did they treat the black graduate students and undergraduates in their questions. classes? That's what yeah. I really wonder. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Um, yeah. Cynthia, yes, please take a moment. Just the, the of course, uh, a, a addendum to that is that when we're looking at so many of these places of inherited trauma, a lot of it, as you were saying, Raquel, also shows up uh, most of the time in the spaces around sex, sexuality, gender, and those experiences, uh, especially in my work. Right? It's it's almost the center point of everything and understanding when folks are trying to pathologize who is most at risk for which diseases or which infections, which also drives a conversation about, well, who is most deserving of the interventions and the treatments mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And, you know, we are in New York, and, and uh, as much as I talk about being born and raised in the South, which I think actually probably is other than the fact that we lost the war, so we're the poorest region of the country, we're gr very grateful that we lost the war, by the way. But, <laughs> Um, <laughs> we're very grateful for that. However, I'm glad that you're centering some of this in New York. In, in our experience, for example, in terms of this inherited trauma, I think it's just only been in the last year or so that uh, the statue of uh, Marion Sims was removed from Central Park. Yeah. And Marion Sims was this ridiculously heinous so-called doctor who is given the wrong moniker of being the father of gynecology. And for those who don't know that part, it's because his work and his studies, his experimentation was done almost solely and exclusively on enslaved black female bodies without any kind of anesthesia. And if I can just, <clears throat> so you understand what that looks like and sounds like, and I love the fact that her name was Lucy because it takes us all the way back to who the original human being is and her name was 
somehow westernly appointed as Lucy. Her name was probably <laughs> something closer to, you know, Busi Siswe. But so the, the first patient to endure James Marion Sims' experience in mental surgery in 1845 was Lucy. She was in Alabama. She remained on her hands and knees on top of a table for more than an hour as Sims sought to repair a hole between her bladder and vagina without giving her any anesthesia, which was not widely used then. She quickly developed blood poisoning after he tried to fashion a catheter out of a piece of sponge, which he later admitted was stupid. And then continued to talk about how her agony was extreme and that he thought she was going to die, mm. but she did not. Mm. And then at least six other women endured four years of similar experimental surgeries. Mm. Take that and apply that to all of this pathology around why is it that we have higher incidences of sexually transmitted infections? Why is it that we have higher experiences with fibroids and all kinds of uterine cancers, more so than anyone else? Why is it that they will tell you immediately that endometriosis and the fibroid experiences are directly connected to our stress? And that stress is what we are talking about in terms of the inherited trauma. Mm. So it is mental, mm -hmm. it is spiritual, it is emotional, and it is right where the center of our ability to sustain ourselves comes from is not, not intentional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that addendum. Thank you. So along those lines, how, how do we work to understand trauma, inherited trauma, as related to racism, homophobia, transphobia, violence? Uh, and to bring it to the youth that we're talking about, how do we work to support the youth who are affected by it, right? We're understanding these pieces. How, what does this intersectionality look like in terms of the systemic isms that we know of? And how are we, how, how are you, how are we working to support the youth? Well, I, I think one of the biggest things is, is the importance of us modeling, you know, what that healing looks like. And that sounds so basic, right? But I would imagine many of us in this room have had instances where maybe our parents or someone who, who uh, was a guardian or something like that just told us to move through difficulties, right? Or move through hard feelings mm -hmm. or move through challenges. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that we just have to overcome, especially in, in the black experience, mm -hmm. right? Isn't enough. Um, and it's not enough for us to eschew all of the methodologies that we could jump into that could help us with that healing. So particularly mm -hmm. thinking about mental health, right? Yeah. Thinking about how the importance of counseling and, and not necessarily looking at it from an institutional standpoint, right? But counseling comes in so many different ways. I was um, at this amazing uh, retreat specifically for black women that was all focused on healing justice. It's through um, Auburn Seminary um, with Lisa Anderson. If you know Lisa, she's amazing. Um, works at Union um, Theological Seminary. And so it was just so important for us to be in, in those spaces as black women, specifically to talk about our, our issues, right? To talk about the harm that we have experienced, to talk about you know this uh, inherited trauma that we so often don't even have spaces to talk about. Mm -hmm. And so that talking is healing, that being in space with our people is healing. And that's why a lot of times nowadays, I will say my sisters are my self-care, mm -hmm. right? Because that being in communion and unity with each other is so important without this kind of dominant white, cis, heterosexual gaze on us. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's important, those aut autonomous spaces. And so a lot of that work has inspired me um, to do the work that I'm doing with black trans circles mm -hmm. so that black trans women can have spaces in their communities where we can do that as well on our own accord because we also have our own very specific um, experiences, particularly with violence, right? Mm -hmm. And because that violence, like I was saying earlier, comes from the state, but it also comes from within our families. It comes from our partners, right? It comes from cis women, you know? And, and we often don't have space to have those conversations in, in, in uh, cis and trans mixed spaces. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's important, and I, I think that starts the conversation, but it's also about the political education. 
So one of the things that we talk about in our circles with black trans circles is um, how do we define violence? You know, we have to really have at least a personal grappling with some kind of definition of what violence looks like and then have a collective definition of what violence looks mm. like mm -hmm. because that is also different. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talk about what happens to black trans women on, on the street, right, being killed on the street, that is connected to the violence of a black trans woman who is incarcerated mm -hmm. or a, a trans woman who is uh, being detained, right? So all of these different areas of the state. But also what about the violence, again, that happens in our homes? So when we are being corrected by our parents or we are being corrected by our families, sometimes that is physical. All of that violence is wrapped up mm -hmm. together. And so we have to be able to look at those connections so that we can find real solutions for all of that healing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, so important. Yeah. And the idea of the, the, the multiple layers the connectedness, but being connected with ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, and, and modeling that for the youth, yeah. right? That we're all in this journey and it's important to be digging deep and making and creating spaces for ourselves and each other, right? I love that line about the sisters being self-care. Yeah, thank you. What else? Um, so the, the uh, work that I do at BARD, the Difference in Media Project, really started through um, one of the one of the co-founders actually is here. I don't think she's in this room, but Juliana Huxtable, who's also speaking at this conference. Um, yeah, so it was really together with my students in this realization that the space that we were in needed to be transformed, and and to do that together meant listening to them. So a big part of it was also sort of questioning the authoritarian structures which themselves are kind of like a form of cis normativity, a form of racialization, um, and sort of um, giving, giving space for the creation. Um, together we created this um, class, sort of interdisciplinary project called Race in the Pastoral, and part of what it's about is looking at the historical and cultural roots of the institutional and lived space and environment that we were in, um, but also doing so in a way that was about creative embodiment. Mm. Um, and so that included creative projects, research, work that Juliana and also Carolyn Lazard and other students um, who are black and queer have carried on in their own work today that's um, you know, taken them, so proud of them, to the Whitney, to the MoMA, to um, all sorts, you know, really amazing work um, that I think um, has been about a very different kind of agency than I tended to be allowed in my own education. So one of the big transformative moments for me was meeting them and realizing, wait, they're my teachers as much as anything else. They're, they changed me, they're here to teach me. And I think that just like you said about the sisters or self-care, finding the community and realizing that we can actually transform these institutions from within. And a big piece that I wanna add too that I've increasingly been integrating in my work is somatics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so guided by Audre Lorde's work, by um, Octavia Butler's work, by Patricia Williams' work, by so many, so many people who talk about our bodies and our lives and our presence, and then what that means in terms of everything from bringing people who do massage and acupuncture, bringing healthy food in, right into where we are, mm -hmm. and integrating that, yep. and sort of, um, my aunt um, was one of the Black Panthers who was in the apartment with Fred Hampton in Chicago. She's also now a, a radical vegan. I've watched her over the years take her embodied practices of healing um, and use those in, in very interesting and very com com mm -hmm. complex ways. So I think there's just a continuous process of, of learning and of acknowledgement um, and of being because what was really taken from us in in the, the kinds of trauma that we've experienced often was just so simple as to be the recognition of who we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, the recognition of who we are, that's beautiful. So trusting yeah. what we know about our bodies, trusting what our bodies tell us, right? Uh, and I love the piece about um, your students being 
your teacher and really looking to them for what you can learn together and how you can transform the different systems together uh, and how we can be thinking about how the youth uh, are, like we're learning together, right? Wherever we think we fall on the spectrum, how we can be learning together and building together um, as opposed to a power over, power down, but um, powered with always, powered together. Thank you. Well, and Cynthia, there are actual tools, right? There are yeah. things in addition to the books, the words and the thoughts, but there are practical science-based mm -hmm. things that are uh, relegated to certain spaces and certain professions or certain uh, people who know those tools and know how to use them. And when you are actually exposed to them, you say, you know what, that, that, those are questions I could ask myself on any given day, right? So as you're talking, I'm thinking about so I'm one of those, you know, we have all these vital signs, right? They come, when you, get, when you show up somewhere, you get your blood pressure, mm -hmm. you get your temperature, you get your pulse, and now uh, pain is supposed to be that fourth one. Uh, I think there's a fifth one, which is around your trauma. Mm. Because it is what will help anyone, but most importantly, the individual understand where their intentionality around uh, being well or not being well versus their passive approach to being well and not being well shows up. For example, the ACEs, right? Mm -hmm. Or what we now have is the urban ACEs. And it literally just stands for adverse child uh, events experiences. or mm -hmm. experiences. And anyone can sit down with the right questions and the right support mm -hmm. to, to measure that and have some predictability in their own lives around where they're going versus waiting for an academic setting, which is usually inside some sort of study, someone else questions me with these things and then takes that data and determines for me what my predictability mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so I guess I'm putting out here is that there are real ways that at the very grassroots level, even among the sisters who collect, mm -hmm. can have a conversation about what this looks like and what do I know about myself. And I actually fit inside a scientific framework, yeah. right, that shows me how so much of what happens to me is actually, or for me, is passive as a result of it just being there that I'm not conscious of versus the part that I may have actual memory about, mostly mm -hmm. the physical stuff, that I may have memory about but I have put it somewhere because I have to survive yeah. or because mm -hmm. I have to cope or because I have to be somebody else for somebody else in order to survive. Yeah. I have to suppress everything about what is informing me about who I am and how I can best be. And I don't think that we have done nearly the amount of work, even as activists and advocates in the community, to figure out how to make that real with our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's terrific. Yeah, and so what does that look like? What does it look like to sit down with somebody and talk about the things that have come up for us that are impacting us from the past in the present today, right? So some folks might say, oh, you're a psychologist. Of course you want to talk about, you know, what happened with your mother or father or didn't happen with your mother or father. But where are the places and spaces that we can sit down and say, oh yeah, you know, I didn't have this or I did have this happen when I was younger and this is what it looks like for me today. You know, where are the sister circles that we can have those conversations? Where are the brother circles or people circles where we can have those critical self-reflective conversations, not just about the past, although, you know, um, occupational hazard, I do think about the past a lot, but in the present, what does that look like in the present for us and for our youth? And how do we help our youth to think about those conversations is related to our topics for today. And how do we do that from an asset-based approach, right? Of so what, like for, if, yeah, if I have more. two young people who uh, come out or are outed, uh -huh. right? And they're both kicked out of their homes. Right. And you have the one student, the one young person who sees being freed from that environment to go and do something and be who they wanna be and make that work. 
versus the young person who internalizes all of that rejection, all of that internalized uh, hatred and stigma and uh, isms about what that means and ends up in the most abject of situations, whether it's homelessness or whether it's in sex work or whether it's just being objectified and subjected to whatever comes right. because their own sense of being has already been so demoralized, dehumanized, and invisibilized yeah. versus the person who says, you know, I am who I'm going to be. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Dad. I've just been waiting for the moment to say sayonara. I got a friend over here who works at so-and-so, and I'm on my way. And then the next thing you know, they're in a nice reality show or something. But I'm saying, <laughs> I don't know. Is there a nice reality show that doesn't involve cooking? <laughs> I don't know. But you, but right. you understand what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. Exactly. So what do we understand sure. mm -hmm. about those trajectories so that we can figure out some things or create with young people the tools that it will take for them to figure it out themselves. Right, absolutely. Yeah. This is one thing I'd say is that the probably, you know, a lot of what I teach is ancient Greek literature. I like the Enlightenment. I tell my students, um, you know, that these things are tools and, you know, they're, they're part of your, ar your arsenal. Um, we read them alongside critical race theory, et cetera. But Speaking to what you said, I, I actually think the most interesting thing that I've learned from my students and the most brilliant thing that I see from them, and this is what I would say especially to the youth in the room, but to everyone, the most interesting thing is actually your own story. And it is so incredible to, so powerful. I was just thinking back to something that um, a freshman at Bard, a girl named Sky, did um, as part of this project for this thing that we do called the Teach-In, and she was, just unbelievable, just laying out. She's a young black queer person. And um, she said, I can be black on Facebook, but I can't be queer. And I can be queer on Instagram, but I can't be black. And then she was showing what she meant by that. Mm. And I was just, this is brilliant. This, isn't, this is not in any article that you could read. I'm learning from this. And also, it was just so clear that she was, you know, um, it was, Empowering isn't even the right word. I mean, it was something else. Um, and it was, you know, to an audience. And I just really encourage all of you, please write your stories, do the, do the work, give us those representations because we need them because they're not there in this culture. Um, we are not visible yet. We're not visible enough. And so please do that because I, I want to. So to is that what more. we call deconstructed? Internet uh, intersectionality. I mean, maybe. I mean, but also just you know the personal is political. Well, that too. You know, too. I mean, I feel like that. <coughs> please, also everyone in the audience, please reread Audre Lorde. Yeah. Please reread James Baldwin. Every one of them. Yeah. Um, Tell us why. I I totally agree that stories are an organizing tool. Like I really believe that stories can be one of our, our greatest weapons or our greatest shield from all the things that the world tries to throw at us. And I, I think that um, there's also some tools from you know media, right, or, or from communications and, and storytelling that we can share and, and you know, help the youth figure out, you know, so that they have those tools in their arsenal. Because I also think once you tell your story to yourself, um, then you can help other people figure out how to tell their own story. And so mm -hmm. that becomes the healing so that you can then connect those threads to this larger tapestry. Mm. Not only that, but that yes. the mm -hmm. acknowledgement that the, well, the stories come from the lived experience, right? Mm -hmm. And that the lived experience is also what I call indigenous expertise. Mm -hmm. And that that indigenous expertise <laughs> is as That's important. terrific. Please write that book. <laughs> I'm that down. I just gave you an assignment. One more book. <laughs> right. So that indigenous expertise brings as much data and science to the table oh, as does it. every single degree sitting at that table, yes. as does every formula sitting at that table, as does every way of conducting research yeah. brings to that table. And yeah. until it is acknowledged and recognized for the p-value that lived experience actually represents the power, that's what p-value really is, the power to actually yeah. judge uh, the, 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 the actual evidence of a study, then we are consistently giving away 
that expertise mm. to someone else for their own agenda and not for the social justice and change agenda that our own stories should actually be affecting. Love it. Now that is significant. I hope somebody recorded that because I owe that Annie a book. Okay, okay. I know. I'm like, that's the book right there. That's the book. Um, so thank you. Yes, and as a qualitative researcher, my heart is singing right now. I won't even go down that rabbit hole. You are so welcome uh, to my world. <laughs> Uh, so how does inherited trauma um, and the resilience, you know, that, that I think is the, the other side of that mirror, provide us with a lens to understand how this particular nation's violent past contributes to the youth homelessness crisis we see today? Because I think there's a way that we can talk about youth homelessness as belonging to certain groups. How does our nation's past play into it and what role do you see that playing in how we have to have this conversation? Well, I think a major way, um, you know, kind of going back to some of the, the historical um, matter that I was discussing and mm -hmm. then relating it right back to personal narrative, I'm just thinking about all the beauty and all the brilliance that I see. I mean, it might be something as simple as the other day I had a conversation with somebody who was dancing on the subway. Um, or just all, all the kids that hang out by the piers I don't know if any of them are here at this conference today, um, but you guys know, maybe if you're not from New York City, you might not be as familiar, but there's a huge community of mostly black and Latino, queer and trans youth who hang out by the piers here. And there's just, there's so much that needs to be heard and needs to be seen from people who are homeless and people who are marginalized. And I think often, I don't even like the word marginalized, but I think often it, it starts with not being seen in particular settings. And then, um, you know, this idea that somehow though those people over there, you know, they don't have value. That's I know that's crazy. Um, and so I think one of the things that needs to happen, just going back to what you said about indigenous expertise is, there needs to be, and I know there already are a lot of direct action mm -hmm. programs, but maybe um, we're just, we're not really doing enough. And you know, I, I just wanna add because <laughs> exactly that indigenous expertise, I mean, has been there. Like obviously it's the 50th anniversary of Stonewall next week. Right. And I think about Sylvia Rivera, right? Who lived on those piers really in protest of how this larger LGBTQ plus nonprofit um, system was ignoring those youth. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that, you know, going back, I think, to some of the points I was making earlier about um, this kind of inherited queer and trans trauma, right, that it may not necessarily be biological, there have been generations of black and Latinx queer youth on those piers. Like right. that is not. And they're still there. Right, and they're still and there. And so Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson are there. Exactly. As my kind of. Exactly, still right. There. So, so these people that, you know, have been so lionized, I think, in the white queer imagination nowadays, right, were so erased and so their voices so extinguished while they were here. And, and that also is another way in which this trauma shows up because I think as, as black and, and brown queer youth learn this history more and share this history more and claim this history more, we see how those systems are still perpetuated. Right? I call it a logic of, of uh, sort of racial necrophilia because black people are only mm -hmm. valuable in this kind of cultural setting. By this, I'm just kind of waving my <laughs> hand and referring to NYU, sorry, but um, et cetera, you know, kind of the culture at large mm -hmm. yeah. that, you know, the, the, the reason why Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera can be celebrated is because they don't threaten the property values of the wealthy mm -hmm. white gay men who live in the West Village now, right around here, right. and of NYU itself, right? That's been one of the very ugly and aggressive landlord and deterritorialization um, expert, right? Through yeah. gentrification, mm -hmm. that the people who are actually there in the present today who represent this ongoing repetition mm -hmm of all of the dynamics that we're talking about, that they are not acknowledged mm -hmm. adequately. Um, <clears throat> right. And so in a way it's almost as if by holding people like Sylvia and Marcia up 
it's a way, paradoxically, I think, to ignore and erase absolution. the present. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's absolution. And, wow. and one of the ways, <laughs> exactly, right? One of the ways that that shows up for me is uh, the consistent pushback. So I want to interrogate this idea of uh, going, giving a lot of uh, the energy to resilience and this word resilience, right? And that there's so much pushback, especially in our spaces of folks who are quote, end quote, survivors of so many of different current traumas that are exacerbated by the inherited mm. or the multi-generations mm. of trauma that mm -hmm. supposedly are in our DNA, mm -hmm. right? And, but the question I have is for the Sylvias and the Marshas and the uh, Iris de la Cruzes and the Katrina Haslips mm. and the Prudence Mabeles and the mm -hmm. Gugujlaminis mm -hmm. is the question mark for me sits between when that person or that community move from resilience to revolution. Mm. And the question mark is what made that happen, when and how, and how do we take that and crush what's necessary around resiliency to what's necessary around change? Mm. And, and that's the piece. Uh, and the, the example that I use in our work is that on any given day, there's 17 plus or minus million uh, people who are women on this planet living with HIV. There probably aren't 25,000 at the most in the world who are out front mm. and are doing the fight against HIV or sexual and gender-based violence or poverty or homelessness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the name of I have HIV and. Yeah. And so the question I have is what y'all got that the other 17 million, 900, 90, 90, 90, 90, I'm an English yeah. major, y'all do the math, yeah. but <laughs> that the rest of those 17 plus million people don't have right. that the world needs uh -huh. so we can end this thing. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the, the tension of resilience and I think these tropes, right, systemically mm. that structural mm -hmm. violence and right. epistemic violence offer us, you know, of, um, you know, that strong, resilient kid or those marginalized kid. I'm like, no, those kids aren't marginalized. We put them in the margins. Or, mm. right. You know, they're not, yes. uh, what's the other term that We're not drives me? We're minoritized. Right, as a, as a researcher, you know, kids who are at risk. I'm like, no, no, can we just name that we're putting them at risk? Right. They weren't born at risk, right? right? right. We right. put them at risk right. and then we put the label and we absolve ourselves yep. of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, you know, a strong black woman, which I, I appreciate as a perspective, but I, <laughs> I it, there, it's a tension for me because it's also an absolution. Mm -hmm. It's saying, I can put more on you. I can put more on you. I can put more on you because you're a beast. You can handle exactly. it. Exactly. I have a lot of thoughts on that. Anyway, and then the black right. mama, and um, then the black mama well, martyr really says, "Oh, that racial science. Oh, yes, absolutely." I can. Yeah. So, okay, so I got off track a little bit. I said I wasn't going to. So, bringing it back, <laughs> right? But but it speaks to the structural violence and the epistemic violence and how our youth are living that out and mm -hmm. naming that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and making that transparent as part of the system as opposed to part of us, right? Um, as if there's something problematic that landed these youth in a homelessness, um, in, in, in homelessness. Uh, so the question, I wanna get back to two things because we're nearing our end. Um, so the two questions that I have for you and you can combine them or, um, you know, books are really important. We were talking about books in the back. You mentioned Audre Lorde and James Baldwin. Why should we read them? What else should we be reading? So maybe one or two titles and why. Well, I think we need to reread um, Audre Lorde's Zami biomythography. For one thing, uh, it really <laughs> pioneers, or might even not be the right word, but it's unbelievable to think about. Um, it's kind of like a ur text for intersectionality. Um, it talks about um, gender and sort of does a kind of, I'd say proto-trans critique of cis. Um, grounding notions of gender in African and Caribbean experience 
in really offers an interesting alternative to I think the heavily theoretical and often sort of relatively vapid yeah. way that we talk about um, I, the intersections of, of race and queerness and gender now using language that tends to be kind of top down, sort of Judith Butler heavy. Uh, um, I'd much uh -huh. rather read Audre Lorde. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> reread Audre yeah, Lorde. Yeah, read and reread and read yeah. again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and James Baldwin's work is also really an example of, of just a kind of rethinking of so much about American culture. Um, mm -hmm. Brilliantly personal. James Baldwin himself was just a high school graduate and he is one of the most incredibly sophisticated writers. I mean, just mm -hmm. model, the, 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 his sentences are just models of yeah. writing and yeah. his work yeah. stands up. I mean, there's this incredible um, essay he has, it's called The Black Boy Looks at the White mm -hmm. Boy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about sort of racial and sexual tension between yeah. James Baldwin and Norman Mailer, but also sort of, um, it's really a, a thinking about masculinity um, that's been yeah. very important mm -hmm. to me, um, his work. So, um, yeah, and if anybody wants to get in touch with me, they can click through to my department um, from the, the website here for this talk, and I would be happy to give anybody a bibliography or, um, you a know. A syllabus. I actually would, sadly. <laughs> anybody who knows me knows that's true. All right, thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I find in these spaces it's really important to lift up some of the texts that we do have about trans history because a lot of that often gets erased and there's a lot of ways in which people say we don't have those texts, right? And so I think about Black on Both Sides by C. Riley Snorton. It's, uh, you know, an amazing just chronicling of, of blackness and queerness and gender nonconformity, um, particularly around the 19th century and, and earlier 20th century. Um, I think about Trapdoor, which was uh, edited by a lot of people and particularly Tourmaline. Um, very amazing account of just like uh, trans mm -hmm. aesthetics just through, you know, the ages. And I think mm -hmm. it's so mm -hmm. important. There's a lot of history there. Um, and then I also lean into the fiction, right? I think oh, in yeah. this time we really need a lot of um, the, those fictions that are, are giving us a glimpse of what the world mm -hmm. could be. Mm -hmm. And so I love Octavia Butler, of course. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much there. I particularly love her series called The Patternist Series. Mm -hmm. So um, Mind of My Mind, yes. all, all of those books are, are beautiful to uh -huh. me. Um, and there's one in, in it that she notoriously hated. So I'm still trying to find it. <laughs> um, but she doesn't want me to have it. So I, I, will, I will try and succeed to her. Um, and then, uh, also, there's this amazing um, black uh, non-binary um, writer named Akweke Amezi, who has an amazing book. Um, uh, I think it's called Salt Water or Sweet Water. I'm, I'm blanking right now. And then has another book coming out um, called Pet. And the protagonists in both of them are black trans folks in the future. And wow. so I think cool. that's beautiful. And then the last thing I'll say, um, uh, I also think the work that um, Adrienne Marie Brown is doing is so powerful for us. So I'm sure a lot of people have emergent strategy, but pleasure activism is out and like blazing so much on, on the charts and everything. Um, and so that's amazing too. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. So because <clears throat> a lot of the work is also uh, deeply political and we've spent the, a lot of this conversation uh, for a large part really focused in on the personal and on the individual, there's a whole other conversation obviously around the structural. And so um, a couple of things that I think are really powerful and for these first two, neither of them is a black woman, oddly enough. But the first <laughs> one is real homework, if you hadn't read it, um, is Democracy in Chains by Nancy McLean. It is probably one of the most important current texts based on absolute research around why, where, how, and who we are in the situation we are in right now in the U.S. Mm. And that understandably, the same conversations that we consistently have historically, the opposition is always having conversations about the long <laughs> game forward. And so this book shows you how that happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, it happens in the first chapter, so spoiler alert. Um, 
is in discovering when she, oh, she's an educational historian, I think. I'm thinking that. And she wanted to learn more about how and why the state of Virginia, right, a, uh, suspended public education for a while. And it was all related to the work that was going on around desegregating schools and that the state of Virginia just decided, well, we're not going to be federalized, so we just won't <laughs> pay for schools. Um, and there was this whole effort in there. But what she ended up discovering as a result of that research was literally the blueprint for what you have seen happen from the right, including from the Southern Manifesto up until the scrotus that's in office now, that, that you, so-called ruler of the United States. So, but that, but that it's already been laid out and paid for by the same names then mm -hmm. that we hear now. So that's the one. The second one is, I used to call this man my movement husband. I think that's deeply inappropriate. And I said, he don't even know me. So one day, he's going to be like, oh, that was you? OK. So he's now my movement muse. And it's Brian Stevenson. Uh -huh. And so if you hadn't read Just Mercy, it is not an easy book. It took me several months because it's so difficult. But this is a man who spends his entire life mm -hmm. doing two things, defending and liberating people on death row mm -hmm. and defending and liberating juveniles who are put unjustly in adult systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what he talks about in terms of recognizing his own brokenness is deeply powerful. It is. And the fact that, and this is how I close on everything, is that he has these four tenets for sustaining social change that mark my movements every day. Proximity, being in and of and close to it, with the people, of the people, and they are at the table. You have to change the narrative. You all can go on in on conversations about what that means. You have to protect the hope, knowing that every day we're doing what we need to do to win, and we will. And the, the fourth one, which is my favorite, especially in certain unique spaces, is you got to be willing to get and be uncomfortable and yeah. make others uncomfortable. Because as long as you're comfortable, you ain't trying to change nothing. Mm. And then there's Tyari P. Jones, an American <laughs> marriage. Don't miss out on her. We could go on and on. Um, and on and on, um, but we are going to have to end this conversation with these amazing human beings. Can you please join me in giving them another round of applause?